we are on trail today of of the snooks. Now, at first, I thought they were called snooks. I've got to be honest, um, but this one uh, seems to rhyme, rhyme with book, so I think it's snook, snook and book. So I think that that's our pronunciation. But uh, in case I'm wrong, do forgive me. But for the purpose of today, hello, Ronnie Lim, we're going to refer to them here as uh, as snooks, and uh, we will. We'll take it from there. So we're going to set off, and, and in between, um, well, we're going to, we're going to, I'll tell you what we're going to do as we walk along. We're going to walk, talk about the history of books and reading, because these are, there's a reason you're about to find out. So let me just flick over to, uh, see what, come over, and, uh, and we'll give you a big reveal. And then I'll tell you why I've got an ever such a slight issue with this one. Um, I don't know if Janie's on. So here we are. Welcome to York. And you will see there, Next to hi Sandra, we've got a sheep, Swaledale. They say, now nah, then. Now, my slight um, issue is that people in York just don't talk like that. They certainly say, all right, that's a Barnsley and a South Yorkshire thing. And uh, Vanos, well, West Yorkshire. And uh, over here, it goes completely to pot because we've got, well, I'll do. That, that is a kind of Yorkshire thing, but I wouldn't hear it around here. By gum. Is Lancashire up road? Maybe might say that over here. Uh, fancy a brew? Okay, I'm all right with that one. Feeling chuffed? Not going to argue. A up love? Nah, not really York. I would say again, Avaganda definitely West Yorkshire. But uh, but some of these A up duck. That's the embrace on That's Nottingham. But nonetheless, they're very colourful. This one's called A up. It's a snook. And so basically, um, a local artist has worked with community organisations, with schools, and, and various organisations sponsored by kind of local businesses. The artist, I'll just look up what her name is, uh, is Lisa, Sean Ellis, um, is the artist. Um, and so each one kind of tells its own story. They all sort of start off looking um, basically pale. So this one, as you can see, it's sites of York. So we've got obviously the Minster in here. We've got... Uh, what is now part of the Castle Museum. We've got a, a tour bus. We've got a lovely ooze bridge with a, a sailboat underneath it. We've got representations of the Castle Museum. We've got afternoon tea from me and Betty's. Then a bit more kind of generic Yorkshire kind of countryside. Of course, we've got Clifford's Tower with a moat. I'm quite sure that uh, there's a moat is very present. But anyway, we've got tea rooms. We've got cups of tea and lovely old buildings. And of course, wildlife because of the river. So I guess it's representing the river. So I'll just kind of pan back and you can have a look obviously at the entirety of the snook. So snooks, yeah, are definitely British, but of course they can owe themselves. What did Alex have in Melbourne? And Ian has various elephants and, and they seem to be very popular. Hello from Russia. Kimberly. They seem to be kind of really popular, these th sort of things now, don't they? They seem to kind of gather, gather attention. And it's great, you know, it gets the kids and people out and about and walking and reason to come into York and this, that, and the other. So uh, it, all the good reason to come through. Um, to, uh, to go and seek them out today. So uh, off we'll go then. So we'll go off on, on our trail. So we're starting at Middleton's on Skullgate. And uh, so clearly the snooks are very bookish. You'll see that each one is reading a book. Hello, Polly. And uh, so they're clearly kind of designed to kind of encourage positive associations um, about reading to children. Because obviously they're targeted at children, it's a family thing. And we're often told it's getting harder. I don't know if Linda from New York is on, but you do tell me if you agree. But we're told it's getting harder and harder. Or, or any of the teachers, um, or grandparents, do let me know. Um, it's getting harder and harder to get children to fall in love with reading and who else have those, Linda. Um, and of course it's not just children. Across kind of most age groups, um, reading books is on the decline because people are tending to look for, let's be honest, kind of more passive forms of entertainment. Maybe this is part to blame. Who knows? Um, so, however, most experts kind of agree, though, that books themselves likely won't disappear entirely, or at least not any time soon. The statistics would suggest that reading as a kind of pastime or leisure activity is generally on the decline. Give me a thumbs up if you call yourself an active reader. What I say by an active reader is that you'd you'd normally have a book on the go. Don't mean you're gonna read every day, but throughout your, your kind of life, you've always got a book on the go. So so give us a wave, give us a thumbs up, give us something just to indicate um, if kind of books is part of your life, if you like. It's, it's kind of part, part of your makeup of who you are and kind of part of your relaxation. So uh, I'll wait for those to kind of come through. Um, but of course, 
what we've seen uh, over recent years um, is the kind of advancements of technology. We have, of course, streamable media, um, smart devices and phones, and they kind of massively occupy society's attention, don't they? And they have a habit of diverting us away from reading. I think he loves books. Lots of thumbs up coming in. Fantastic. Um, so I think, you know, we've got a technical challenge, haven't we? However, it's said that reading has far more benefits than simply consuming the media. So in other words, it's not just about the intake of information. Studies have shown that reading strengthens the neural connections in the brain, specifically those associated with communication and language. And this is why we're obviously so keen to get little ones reading, because reading and writing, speaking, these kind of skills of communication are so important. And reading and being read too are incredibly brilliant triggers for a uh, panic if you haven't got a book on the go. Fantastic, um, says Michelle. So it's also that reading can improve concentration. It can increase vocabulary. The river's up, by the way. I'll show you the river in flood as we go past. Um, so increase our vocabulary and ward off cognitive decline. So incredibly important as we get into our later years to keep mentally stimulated. Reading, puzzles, conversation, being active socially, coming on virtual tours, being stimulated. Incredibly important. If we want the brain is muscle, if we want it to stay fit, healthy, active and responsive, we've got to use it. And reading is a fabulous way of doing that. So why then do people prefer to... Uh, to watch TV, movies, or consuming kind of other types of media rather than reading? Well, of course, there's no one answer to this, but it would seem that watching TV, movies, Netflix and chill, you know, um, is a kind of pretty passive activity that doesn't require much effort on the part of the viewer. And in kind of today's sort of jam-packed world, people, maybe working people particularly, want to come home from work put the feet up after a long day, working, commuting, and settling down something relaxing. Or maybe they do the reading while commuting, who knows? But anyway, um, now of course many people still enjoy reading, but increasingly they're using electronic devices. So is anybody on here, I think somebody already mentioned, Kindle. How many of you are now reading through tablets, smartphones, Kindles, or other forms of, uh, kind of electronic means rather than physical books themselves yeah we'll have a little down the down the tower gardens we'll cross over we're gonna have a look for there's another one apparently somewhere on the eye of york near the castle so we're on the search of our second uh of our snooks it's somewhere we think on the eye of york somewhere by the, by the castle museum but we'll find it a lovely doggy and so down we come so uh, do let me know if you are i uh, said so susan o is a fan of electronic books I must say, it, I, I, to a degree, I do a little bit, because my eyesight isn't great, particularly in low light, so it's quite good, the kind of backlit screen, but I do prefer a physical book. Um, audio books, we'll talk about that a little bit, actually, uh, Michelle. So, we are perhaps reading, but consuming it in a different way. Does that count as a reading? Well, I guess so, of course it is. So, Catherine, as a Kindle as well, probably very convenient for those out and about. Catherine gets out and about a lot. Stick it in your bag, you've got it wherever you go. Just remember to charge it, right? I mean, nothing worse with it. It's running out of batteries before you get to the last page. Murder that, wasn't it? Um, so, do you think with this trend of paper books going to disappear? Well, I kind of Googled this. I'm a bit flooded here. Yeah, it is, of course. It's York. Of course it's flooded. Creative right heels, that's interesting. Um, Fran reads a tablet through Apple Books, loves audio books, loves reading paper books. It's great. I mean, I think you can have all of it, can't you? I mean, that's the thing is it's not one or another. And for some times, it might be better to be electronic at other times. Nice to have some paper. Um, so most experts have Googled this about, you know, a paper, they can disappear. And most experts agree that kind of hard copy books still provide valuable, value to people um, that many continue to appreciate. And it's very likely they won't disappear entirely, or at least not anytime soon. However, kind of like vinyl records, I guess, woodplot printing, hand-processed film, and kind of folk weaving, printed pages may become sort of a specialist, luxury, almost artisan item. Maybe we're looking for kind of sustainability and kind of recyclable papers and vegetable links and all these sort of things. 
and um, but also um, people having books for the aesthetic kind of value. You see, the coffee books, the art catalogues, the photography books. Uh, you know, we can get away with having nudie books, can't you, on your coffee table because it's arty, right? So those kind of books, it may well be, um, you know, continue to do well even if kind of novels, handheld kind of paperbacks, don't kind of do so well. So the books, perhaps, that are meant more to be looked at than read um, may well kind of survive long into the future but the reality is on the stats that we have is that uh, people continue to buy books to add to their personal collection they host reading clubs check out books in public libraries which is fantastic and in addition to the used book in addition as well you've got the used book and resale market getting popularity as more and more people are thinking about sustainability and environmental concerns a lot of book swaps and these you know where you're going to leave a book a few places i've visited have like telephone boxes that uh, you know you've then got people coming in and uh, dropping a book in taking one out to get a book swaps that sort of thing and uh, of course as susan's saying about getting as a gift you're giving and receiving books remains you know still a major major uh you know source of our kind of gifts so you know i think and this is valued by many many cultures across the globe so it's not really just you know an issue in one country all this transition to electronic media seems to be kind of on the march but equally it seems that right now we value books so here we are then our second of the snooks today and so we're here by the castle museum on the eye of york and uh, the iron snook it would appear apparently has been vandalized uh, the image here is of like the Iron Man, you're the Ted Hughes. So perhaps that is uh, appropriate because the Iron Man gets very sad and ends up getting destroyed. Comes off the cliff if I can remember rightly. So this is our snook number two. Uh, he is called the Iron Snook. And we can only assume that he's reading some kind of sort of sci-fi novel. This is not exactly difficult to uh, just suss that out, I think. But as you can see, he's been stapled together. So obviously there's been some form of uh, of vandalism that's going on. Go on, tell us what happened to him. People climbing on it. People climbing on it, unfortunately. A bit too enthusiastic, sadly, but uh, so there we go. Yep. So you can hear that, yeah, that's a good, good, do the knock. Yeah, because they are sort of fiberglass. They are sort of quite solid, but obviously at the same time, anything can be destroyed, right? Particularly if you set out and try and destroy it. So uh, it's a shame, but there we go. So number two snook today. Sorry, guys, I'll come out your way. You you're you're live. Oh, let me, I've got 52 people on. What, it's on, on live, yeah. Wow. Yeah. 52 people on you. You'll see you there. Say hello from York. Hello. Very friendly in York. Where are you from? I'm from York. Oh. Fantastic. Okay, so let's say, uh, who'd harm a snook? Exactly, who'd harm a snook? It does seem rather harsh, doesn't it? But uh, I guess we may well come across a few then that are kind of wrapped up in... Uh, Where are Why have you got like seven phones? So, well, one's my notes. Right, anyway. So off we will go. And you can see the signs. It's a snook. It's a oh. science fiction snook. Like can say hi? You can say hi. Hi. A very friendly group today. Meow. All just want to say hello before we walk on our way. I'm a cat. You're a cat. Meow. Fantastic. So let's leave snook number two behind. Look great there with the castle behind us. And uh, so there we are. Poorly damaged snook. But uh, he's, uh, he's been patched up. So hopefully he'll live to fight another day. So snook number two. So do let me know. What do you think of Schnook number two? Kind of cute in a scary sort of way. He's very industrial, isn't he? He's very kind of space agey, is, uh, is this particular Schnook. So, perhaps the threat to the future of reading is kind of overstated. But could we imagine a world where nobody read? Well, we don't really kind of need to because it's part of our human story. If you go back far enough, there was a time when nobody read. So today, as we kind of seek out these bookish snooks, we're going to tell that story of how we came from a world where nobody read to where we are today. Whatever the future might look like, let us spend a bit of time thinking about the past, where we've come from. And there's no better better reason than York to think about the past, because we have it all around us in spades. These kids do want to get in front of the camera. It's fantastic, Larry, yeah. 
I think the best thing is you just say hi. There's no point trying to say no to people, which get disruptive. So give them their little 15 seconds of fame, as you might say. These days, not even 15 minutes, is it? And uh, they're happy they're on the way. And uh, we can all enjoy it. And uh, of course, you know, they are the future of live streaming. It's not people my age. So hopefully they'll be inspired to pick up a gimbal and a camera and have a go for themselves. Hello, David Nero. So, um, let's think this. So where does the history of reading begin? Well, archaeological evidence points to Mesopotamia around 6,000 years ago. So Mesopotamia is an historical region of West Asia. I'm situated in the Tigris Euphrates system. So you might have heard of the Fertile Crescent, the beginnings of civilization, around four rivers, the Nile, Tigris, Euphrates, and the Hindus. It's the beginnings of the history of the world, really. And um, today, Mesopotamia is known as Iraq. So around 4,000 years ago, 4,000 years BC, rather, um, urban centers started developing in Mesopotamia as trading centers um, for agricultural produce, which are kind of creating vast levels of wealth. So huge amounts of agricultural produce being done, lots of buying, lots of selling, and the urban centres come together as marketplaces. And um, it's here in the kind of hustle and bustle of the marketplace that an unknown individual changes the course of human history by using some squiggles on clay to represent a goat and an ox. And there, at the birth of the concept of writing, the representation of spoken sounds using visual signs, its inseparable twin, the art of reading, was also born. So writing was initially used to keep records of transactions that involved, involved several entities and were carried out across vast distances. So the earliest known clay tablets used pitch-like signs to depict lists of goods. So the earliest form of writing on our planet, called proto-cuneiform, was invented in Mesopotamia during the late Uruk period, around 3200 BC. And we've got a picture. So let's see if you, any librarians know about your proto-cuneiform. It's pretty cool. Um, so not a million miles away from kind of hieroglyphics, when the image kind of comes up, you'll see its representations. So it's simple drawings of the subjects of the documents. And early symbols kind of represented these ideas drawn or pressed into puffy clay tablets. So you'll see a lot of indentation is kind of going on in there. So then they're fired in a hearth or baked in the sun. So in effect, it becomes a baked clay tablet. So proto kind of cuneiform was not a written representation of the syntax of spoken language. Its original purpose was to kind of maintain records of the vast amount sorry, ah, here is, um, of trade of goods and labour during the first flowering of the urban Uruk period in Mesopotamia. Now, word order didn't matter. So two flocks of sheep could be written as sheep flocks too. Same in Latin, by the way. There's no syntax in Latin. Um, no word order issues. Um, but you've still got enough information to be understood. So that kind of accounting requirement, I'll just get rid of that for you. Um, so, we do. Yeah. so that kind of accounting requirement, the idea of kind of proto-cuneiform itself, almost certainly evolved from the ancient use of clay tokens. And clay tokens were used to represent the thing that were being traded, whether that be grains or fabrics or alcohol or vinegar or spices. Clay, clay t tokens were used to represent them. Um, so the earliest characters of proto-cuneiform are impressions of the clay token shapes. So cones, spheres, tetrahedrons, pushed into the soft clay. Um, and scholars believe the impressions were meant to represent the same things as the clay token themselves. So measures of grain, jars of oil, animal herds. So in a sense, proto-cuneiform is simply a technological shortcut. I mean, instead of carrying around these clay tokens, your wealth or goods for sale can be expressed in one easy to carry tablet. In essence, a book. The, so we'll talk about them, continue about talking about that in a minute. But uh, let us, as we are down nearby the, uh, the Jorvik Viking Centre, just over there, 40th anniversary coming up very, very soon, we have Harold Hardreader. So, like Harold Harthacunut, 
He's a Viking. So this time, of course, we have him reading about Eric Saga, which is a tiny bit, of course, of a stretch. As many of you will know, the Vikings had an oral storytelling culture. They didn't really have written stories as such. Of course, there are runes and representations of things. But by and large, they were an oral storytelling culture. So this isn't really especially representative of uh, Viking culture. But it's a bit of fun. And as you can see, they're pretty big, uh, these. Um, so please do not climb on me. So we'll, we'll desist the urge to climb. So this one has not been damaged. And uh, pretty cool, of course. I mean, many will get upset, say the horns. No horns. But uh, of course... They've all got the horns, so we'll forgive that. So yeah, Harold Hardreader, as in like Harold Hadrada, uh, who of course, Harold Hadrada, was, uh, led the invasion of Vikings in 1066, the first of three battles that defined the history of England, the Battle of Fulford, fought in here, in September 1066, the victory to Harold Hadrada and Tostig, and then again, the Battle of Stamford Bridge, a few days later, also involved Harold Hadrada, but of course, at that time, the Vikings were smitten. So I rather like this guy. I, 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 how do we think? So if we're going to do a one, two, three so far, you've only seen three, of course. Let's, let's give him an order, guys. Where, where, where are we going to put Harold Hardreader, the, uh, the Iron Schnook, and of course, our first one, who's named Aup Schnook. So do let me know which one so far has been your favourite. Um, he is quite lovely, isn't he? So let's kind of walk on. So... Just to kind of remind you, just in case you, 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 you forgot what I'm talking about, we're talking about these clay tablets, these cuneiform tablets, proto-cuneiform. And they weren't kind of designed to be kept. They were records of transactions. And so once the kind of trade had been made, the tablet will be then discarded, um, which is kind of significant. So it wasn't something that was a part of the... that you'd look to keep. And funny enough, the bulk of these tablets were discovered in archaeological digs in the 1920s. And they'd been used during the kind of ancient world period for kind of later rebuilding projects. They used as kind of backfill, like rubble, really. So huge numbers of these tiles were basically used to kind of fill in spaces, build kind of foundations of walls and this, that, and the other. So they hadn't, there wasn't a value placed upon them. Once they'd had their use... Um, you know, as, as, as a kind of a, a recording system, they use their purpose. They were then to be utilised for other things. So the vast majority were these, this kind of style of kind of recording transactions. But there was a small number of these tablets that contained more sophisticated forms of writing. And uh, this cuneiform allowed the earliest examples of literature, such as the legend of Gilgamesh, and also kind of various bragging stories about rulers. So... It is, uh, Fran, but as I say, partly it's because they were treated as rubbish. And so it's only when they were digging out and excavating buildings that, uh, pardon me, um, that they found them. They'd been underground, so of course they hadn't been kind of exposed to the elements. They'd been simply used to sort of backfill uh, and creating kind of foundations of buildings. So remarkable, there you go. So the written story that was designed to be read arrives with this handful of small proto-cuneiform tablets that don't record anything to do with trade and quantities and goods, but rather begin to tell stories. In a very rudimentary form, but stories to be read, stories to be kept, begins with these tablets. So we think around 2600 BC, cuneiform scripts develops and writing becomes more versatile. It was used to document laws and to narrate the laws and deeds of kings, in addition to obviously keeping a record of transactions. So we're starting the emergence of the modern state, but also the, the bigging up of individuals, telling stories, biographies. So we're starting to see writing being used to the glory of individuals. So we're really kind of beginning to start to get a connectivity with what books and reading we've got biographies um, now in each cuneiform script each symbol was represented by a different sign and the number of characters wanted to learn um, in order to kind of write and read this ran into hundreds so pretty not dissimilar to kind of modern day 
so Chinese with its kind of, I don't know how many characters you have to learn in Chinese and Japanese, it's an awful lot, isn't it? Um, so not dissimilar to that. Um, so to be a scribe in ancient Mesopotamia was an enormous achievement. It's pretty simply of high birth, very well educated, and if a king could read, he'd make sure to be boasting about this in his inscriptions. He was such a sort of scarcity of people that had this skill that it could be, be kind of renowned. This is the king that can read, right? So elaborate kind of system of schools trained young scribes from an early age. And the ancient kind of pioneers of writing and reading um, were aware and in awe, I think, of this kind of potential, this new form of communication. So you've seen um, the, the, the previous form, of, which is more like hieroglyphic. And now you now have a look at this cuneiform, which I think is really, really very, very different indeed. Um, it doesn't look at all like what we've looked at previously. Um, you'll see it's indents, it's grooves, but it is much more consistent. We've got a standardization, and of course, this important thing about kind of reading for anybody that's able to do it or writing is that everybody can agree what the symbols mean. There's a uniformity to it, so it doesn't matter who is able to read this or translate it, it means the same thing. The symbols are being used in the kind of same way. Now, What's a lovely little story um, that I kind of found out is that in ancient Mesopotamian culture, birds were considered sacred because the marks that their feet made on the wet ground resembled cuneiform. So imagine birdies walking across a beach, right? Um, and so the people believed that these are the sacred messages from the gods that were waiting to be translated. So birds were absolutely revered in this culture, which is absolutely wonderful, isn't it? Um, it's hello, Alex from France. Isn't it wonderful just the thought of um, seeing little birds walking through damp uh, sand and believing it that, uh, that that is messages from the gods? So, how lovely to, to just find these stories to share with you from time to time. Um, so, as ancient kind of writers discovered their power to make and alter myth and history, the first works of literature were written. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but the first author in history is actually, or the first known author in history, surprise, surprise, it's not a man. It is a woman. And there's huge kudos to anybody that knows the name of this woman. If you do, stick it in the chat. In the meantime, we're going to have a look at Schnuck, number four, and then we'll tell you about the first author in history. So this one is... Uh, Schnucks Love All Books. It is uh, this one promoted by Make It York, our kind of visitor, um, York Promotion, Destination Management Organization. Um, and uh, so I guess they're promoting the trail itself, discover the secrets of York's past and present, York's sightseeing and history. And uh, yeah, so a lot of this is about kind of York itself looks. So dating back to 71 AD, York's walls are 3.4 kilometers long, was a complete example of medieval walls in England today. So lots and lots of books, but of course the reality is, is that most people don't read books about York. They'll go online and they'll watch videos on YouTube, about like you're doing right now, to find out what's here and what to see. But uh, it's nice to think that they, they could have gone to the history books of York, but I suspect the proportion of people that do so is fairly modest. But we've got lots of schnooks at play here, and schnooks love books. This is what we're told, quite clearly. Schnooks love books, so uh, they're never happier than when they are by books. So uh, consequently, let's have a look. We're supposed to be able to find a snook sleeping, a snook with flowers, two snooks reading the same book, a snook wearing glasses, five apples, a ladder. Well, I've got to go forever this. Um, so let's see if we can find a sleepy snook before we move on and we talk about the world's first published author. Let me see a sleeping snook. Oh, I think, is that a sleeping snook? Does that count? I expect that's a sleeping snook over there yeah and what else we were looking for a snook with flowers let's just try and find the snook with flowers before we uh before we move on i can't see it just yet i like the, all the letters look are falling out of the book need a umbrella to cover over i can't see a snook with flowers but uh nevertheless oh there we are oh, is that it is that flowers that's sweet, isn't it? And fruits. I can't find I give up. 
the snook trail has defeated me. So, so did anybody guess? I don't think that uh, anybody has mentioned. It would, I really would be incredibly impressed if you knew this. Um, so the first author in... This is your favourite. So the first author published um, in history is an Akkadian princess and high priestess whose name is Enna Duana. Um, and she composed temple hymns um, around 2000 BC. And she signed her name on the clay tablets on which she inscribed her works. So let us, uh, let us show you Enna Duana's tablets. Doing well with the images today, Anna. No messing up so far. Um, so Enna Duana. So her works are complex lyrical poems. And she's thought to be the first who explicitly set out to address the absent reader. She came up with the phrase, dear reader. Isn't that wonderful? 2,600 years BC, Enna Duana was inscribing into these clay tablets, dear reader. That is just blows me out. It's beautiful. Because um, it's specifically acknowledging, isn't it, that reading is a mode of communication between the writer and the receiver, the reader. So I absolutely love that. Enna Duana, that's her name. So great question. If ever it comes up in a quiz, you'll now know you're smashed out of the park. So I'm sure you remember that. <laughs> Nobody is going to forget. Um, so let's go on to our next schnook. Hopefully you're enjoying this. Are you enjoying this tour? Are you enjoying about cuneiform and Enna Duana? Are you enjoying the schnooks? Do let me know if this is floating your boat. So now then, we are, ah, right, okay. So this is sponsored by the Yorkshire Roast. And let's just read what they said. In 20, this is a story of a legend, this. In 2017, the heart of God's own county, York, witnessed a culinary revolution, the, the Yorkshire pudding wrap. Since that momentous creation, the world has never been the same. Absolutely, completely agree with that. The Yorkshire pudding wrap is one of those things that as soon as you heard it, you thought, why has nobody thought of this before? And uh, absolutely fabulous, uh, and, and it's, it's just everything you imagine it to be. Available for meat eaters and those that like a veg-based diet, it, they are epic. I'm not sure if you get a vegan version. Can they do a dairy-free? I don't know. And then maybe, maybe kind of Google it and kind of find out. But um, it is absolutely fantastic. So we've got a little, uh, a bit piggy. There is he, like a hog. Um, but also we've got a little sort of a, a maitre d' kind of look, a little moustache, isn't he? And he's got a bit of a cheeky wink going on there. So rather pleased with himself, a pig nose stuck. So it's just the kind of adaptability really of these, isn't it? That you can, in essence, make them really be whatever it is that you want them um, to be. Um, so his book, of course, then, is uh, The Yorkshire Roast's Secret Recipe. And we've threatened, haven't we? I keep saying that I'm going to do so. He's called Yorkie Roasty Snooky. York Roasty Snooky. That uh, we're going to tour and we're going to make some Yorkshire puddings and some northern food. So we'll kind of prompt me into doing that. You make them delicious, Catherine loves them. So made in Yorkshire, proudly British, a oh, white rose, that rather gold rose, isn't it? But maybe it's a gold star they've awarded to themselves for their uh, wonderful things. And of course, the penny comes right around the back and tied to a lovely bow. So I'm just gonna have a look where we're going next on our map. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit more about reading because I love it. Uh, oh, right, where, so, so that was there, number two. So down David Gate. Oh no, we're down. Where's number three? King Square, right, we're in King Square. Okay, so let's go to King Square. What are those stubby trees behind him? These stubby trees here are, I think, London Plains trees. They've been pollarded to within an inch of their life, although it's going to cut back. Um, but I believe that they are London Plains, uh, these trees. Um, if that's what you're talking, a little sneaky peek of the mince there. In the middle. So Yorkshire puddings with onions are yummy, says Dawn. Couldn't agree more. Um, it's a marriage made in heaven with its onion gravy or roast onions. Put them in the oven, just let them go soft, they're incredibly sweet. Soft and tender, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Oh, I'm, I'm salivating at the very thought of such things. So Dawn, stop it now, otherwise I'll, I'll have to run away and leave the tour to, uh, to go and get some food. So we're heading towards King's Square now. Should we go this way? Uh, let's go the pretty way, shall we, towards King's Square? Because we're not going to, we're scheduled to go on the shambles this way, so we'll give you a little, a little hint of a shambles, a little bit of shambles ankle, as you might say, to uh, just set the pulse racing. And then... Uh, We'll go to the shambles again in due course. So, thinking about reading, um, obviously, it's important to recognise that the earliest kind of written texts were meant to be read 
out loud. The kind of characters were written in a kind of continuous stream to be kind of disentangled by the skilled reader when reading out loud. So punctuation was, a, was first used only around 200 years BC. And it's kind of erratic well into the Middle Ages. So all these early forms of writing, all the cuneiform, proto-cuneiform, end of Joanna's text, no punctuation whatsoever. So it's really down to the skill of the reader in reading this stuff out to make sense of it, to get the kind of timber, the pace of it, as you might say, and to kind of get meaning from it, might say, and to kind of get meaning from it. So consequently, um, the masses, of course, are still illiterate, um, and the written materials only reach to them through public readings. So public readings um, took place in royal courts and monasteries. So it's kind of important to recognise that, that reading was, th was something that happened to you, you were read to. We haven't yet reached the time where people are reading for themselves. That's another milestone in the history of reading and books that simply we haven't got to yet. Um, but before we do, we're going to talk about libraries. Now, I've read on some of your comments, people talking about libraries, your school librarians, your little, your little glance of shambles ankle, as we said, as we're going past. Um, so any of you know where the first libraries start how far back we're going to talk about histories of libraries again i'm very impressed if you know so there's no prizes but there's kudos you've got massively in my esteem i mean you're all very high in my esteem but uh, i'm super easy impressed by knowledge i think knowledge is cool i hate anti-intellectualism i think we've got to a stage where suddenly being uneducated is seen as uh, a kind of progressive thing as if you're rejecting mainstream media and all these people trying to influence you and I think it's absolute baloney of course there's some rubbish printed but for the most part I think being educated is the biggest gift that we can give to ourselves the biggest gift we can give to the world to our communities to our families and those around us so uh, I really do dig knowledge and uh, that's why I think that uh, I take so much pleasure in sharing that knowledge with you so history of libraries and it's the Assyrian ruler and this is a terrible name to pronounce it's Ashperbanipal put together a library of clay tablets in Nineveh, which is also, right, in modern day Iraq. Do you remember just before, uh, you probably won't know because obviously some of you are British, but just before um, the invasion of Iraq in 1990, there was a Lieutenant Colonel in the British forces who became very famous for, for kind of giving his sort of like, his patnesque before the battle, Henry V, the ninth before the battle speech. But instead of kind of rip roaring and being about violence, he said, tread carefully here, this is the cradle of civilization. That so much of our kind of biblical land and history and civilization, everything we come is from these countries that have become kind of power to take kegs of uncertainty um, in, in the Middle East. But anyway, so Nineveh. Um, and this collection was kind of amassed at the height of the Assyrian Empire, mostly as we said, through plunder. Um, and it housed, I think, you know, up to a million original tablets dating back to the second millennium BC, featuring works written both in Sumerian and Akkadian. So specialised scribes were employed to produce copies of these important works because obviously you know, they were only produced individually. Um, and fiercely sort of possessive of his collection, Ashurbanipal threatened anyone who dared to misplace his books with terrible fates. So if you've ever lent books out, I think you can probably sympathise with that viewpoint because I think I'm tempted at times to, to kind of threaten people with terrible fates if they don't bring back the books. And, and more important, so if they bring them back in the condition that they lent them out in. You don't see any killed corners, split spines, or anything nasty like that. So uh, he kind of threatened death if you're going to mess up, which is probably a little bit over the top, but, uh, but nonetheless, I can see where it's coming from. So in front of the York chocolate story, we have the next one of our schnooks. And uh, do you just give me a nice ge geographic running commentary? Um, poem featuring Nineveh, there we go. Um, Toy World, you see building a York story is now? So there we are at the chocolate story, the history of chocolate, York being called the chocolate city, city of Quakers and Quaker chocolate makers. So you'll see that this one, who is called Coco the Chocolate Snook, is, a, is covered in cocoa beans, we see over here. And uh, the chocolate's being made up. Of course, chocolates were once a luxury item, only for the very, very wealthy. It's the discovery of cocoa butter, the cocoa press by the Roundtree's factory here in York that revolutionised chocolate to make it affordable and something we could all enjoy. So on top, going to get icing, 
hundreds of thousands, do you call them hundreds of thousands in America or Canada, wherever you are online? We call these oh, sprinkle, sprinkles, sprinkles, we call them hundreds of thousands. Let me know what you call them, where you are. Um, let's have some ice cream on the top and a more sweetie. So he's not terribly good for uh, the waistline, this snook, but uh, he is uh, very agreeable, it has to be said. And uh, let's hope we don't get any hot sunny days, otherwise he's bound to, to melt. It's not clear the book that he's reading, but of course what we can see is that the melted chocolate is coming down, sprinkles, okay, is coming down on the cocoa pods. So it suggests that he's reading about the history of chocolate. And interesting, chocolate, by the way, is a poison. We need to eat it in a very specific and controlled way. Otherwise, you'll die, which is kind of odd, isn't it, when we think it's going to become one of the world's most indulgent kind of products. But yeah, chocolate is a poison. You can get all Agatha Christie and look that up and find out how to kill somebody with kindness. We just look yummy, doesn't he? But I say, let's hope it doesn't get out a hot day and melt. So that is Coco the Chocolate Snook. Some place in the USA call them Jimmy. Is that right, Robin? I didn't know that. So there's the sprinkles, right? Is that what we're talking about? It's still the same thing? So we call them hundreds and thousands because obviously you get an awful lot of them in a tub. And we used to have them on buns as a kid. So you get like a regular vanilla bun, a bit of white icing, and then sprinkles of these on. Maybe an ice cream bit a little bit later on, but originally they were on buns. And uh, we loved them. And if you could get away with it, you know, you'd sneak in, sneak into the cupboard and, uh, and just fill your face full of hundreds and thousands and nice things. There we go. Coco the Chocolate Snook. So Carpe Diem, absolutely, we only need to Carpe this Diem, don't we? So I think the next one, we're going to, we're going to make sure I just haul next. So we'll talk about libraries. And uh, how my mum was a librarian, by the way, um, for those that don't know. She ran the library in the village, which was fab. So every day after school, I didn't go home. Uh, but the school was very close, only about three, two or three minutes walk. I would walk to the library and I'd be there till she finished, about half four in the afternoon. So my job was putting away the books. So the next thing I'm going to tell you is something that I know of a great deal about systems and ordering um, but I loved it uh, I, I really enjoyed it then she went on to uh, have a bookshop in York the Penguin Bookshop worked there which is lovely too um, so um, we're talking about then the horrible kind of <laughs> threats that Ashurbanipal um, would threaten people with if, if they didn't look after his books his tablets rather now centuries later Alexander the Great and this is in 331 BC founded the city of Alexandria in Egypt and within years, Alexandria had evolved into a kind of multicultural city with a complex um, bureaucracy. And um, Alexander's successor, a guy called Ptolemy, have you heard of Ptolemy? Very important kind of figure in, in ancient history. He founds the Library of Alexandria. And it has the short term kind of purpose of organising the vast reams of documents that have been stockpiled in the city and the kind of ostentatious long-term purpose of housing all the knowledge in the world. So I guess it probably wasn't until the internet came along that we had that idea, again, that it was possible. But Ptolemy had that idea, okay, around kind of 300 BC, that all the knowledge of the world could be contained. And so, and the great library of Alexandria was known as one of the wonders of the world. And... So in order to kind of achieve this goal, how he set out to get all the knowledge is really, really cool. Um, what he does is, um, Alexandria's in a kind of really good location to do this, by the way. Um, so, you know, if, if you're going to be a pirate, be a good place, right? Pick your spot first. Thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, in order to kind of achieve this then, so all ships are stopped at Alexandria, and they have to surrender all the books, all the tablets they had on board, to be copied or retained at the library. Isn't that cool? So basically, it becomes a clearinghouse for knowledge. Um, so the Great Library of Alexandria, one of the seven wonders of the world, destroyed, of course, was sort of the ultimate repository for knowledge of the ancient world. So the history of kind of cataloguing or organising written material is even older than the first formal libraries. Now, let me know on here if we've got any fans of Dewey Decimal, because I love it. And so when I used to put books away at the school in, Bishop Thorpe, in, the, in the library at Bishop Thorpe, I was fascinated that you could have a number for everything. No matter how niche something was, you could just add another number onto it. So 8.2.4.7.9, .4 you know? Could be the, the history of snail breeding in, in Lancashire. Um, 
That's not, I've made that up. But you know what I mean? There's nothing too niche. You can just add another number, you subdivide. It's a brilliant system. It really appeals to my kind of logical brain, kind of partly kind of OCD ish idea of, kind of organizing the universe, the building blocks of knowledge. Can be similar. And that's, of course, why, in, in many respects, why the internet is so frustrating because it's not catalogued. Um, it's, it's a really weird one. Uh, this is St Andrews, rather. Bedden Hall is sort of tucked away down on the other side of where we are here. Um, so, sorry, so it's over here, Ben Nora, right, over on my left. Um, so the Dewey Decimal, Catherine knows what we're talking about. She knows what she knows. I wrote that Dewey Decimal. Um, so in the ancient Sumerian language, record keepers were called the ordainers of the world. Isn't that wonderful? The ordainers of the world. And the first of a catalogue of books is the catalogue of the Egyptian House of Books, which dates back to 200 BC. So Ben Hall, yes, yeah, just, just in front of us where we are now, just around the corner. So the Library of Alexandria was a laboratory for a lot of the kind of early experiments in library science, mainly through the works of Callimachus of Cyrene, who catalogued the Library of Alexandria in the second century BC. Um, Robin loves Dewey Decimal as well. I think that if you've got a certain type of brain, it really appeals to you. Um, for others, maybe enjoy chaos more, uh, you know, kind of discovery and anarchy and creativity and what might happen when you find things by accident. So I get completely why. Um, but I think that certainly appeals to me. So what Kelly Mackers did is he arranged titles into lists, or he called them pinnacoi, according to categories including drama, lyrical poetry, legislation, history, medicine, and philosophy, and miscellanies. And of course, one of the famous things to fall out of this, of course, is metaphysics, isn't it? In Plato. There was not an invention of something called metaphysics, but was held in the category of other located after physics, meta after physics. So metaphysics means simply it was located in the category after physics, but didn't have a name for it. So it just shows how that actually influenced science, our thinking, our identities, Western philosophy. Um, so he was also, uh, kind of also the first librarian to use alphabetical ordering to arrange books within those, uh, with those genres. So he was kind of the world's great organizers in history. Um, and though libraries kind of remained highly exclusive spaces for centuries after these developments, um, kind of accessible only to this kind of privileged and skilled col uh, scholars, the concept of a kind of comprehensive library catalogue would prove invaluable to generations of readers roaming the aisles of these storehouses of information in search of knowledge. So there we go. In case you, in case you wondered, Callimachus is the man, Ptolemy is the enabler, and the great library of Alexandria, one of the great wonders of the world, really kind of taught us how to think about knowledge. It's like when I did my history degree, you have a thing called historiography, which is like the study of history. You know, history is an event, history a story, um, and of course you can have history written down as, as history books. Um, so thinking about knowledge in these ways, categorising, creating systems, creating structure and order and natural flows. So this is The Greatest Hits. It's Radio Snooky, and I believe he is associated with Greatest Hits Radio. Um, so very modern, and I suspect, akin to what we were kind of talking about earlier, I suspect this is an online uh, radio station. I don't know I'm particularly aware of. Um, so I guess it's it sort of bringing it up to date, isn't it? Is it? But again, this idea of transmitting knowledge um, through kind of digital means rather than kind of the paper. Um, arrange what's by colour. Absolutely. Yeah, you can do that. I mean, a lot of people collect penguin books because they're very distinctive orange spine. I don't think any penguin collects on here. Um, Julie wants to do Queen Victoria. Um, lots of libraries. Alexander, one of the great tragedies, absolutely, friend. Um, it certainly is. Um, so I don't know how we feel about this. It's very sort of technical. Um, I suppose, is it, is it reflecting all the different kind of shades and genres and different kind of varieties you can find on the radio? I don't know what you're kind of saying in terms of its coloration, but it's, a, it's rather agreeable. In fact, in, in many respects, because it, it's trying less hard in terms of the messages to it. And if I was going to have one in my garden, this probably would have been the one so far, because I kind of like the fact it's just kind of, it's modernist and quite sort of simple and bold, but it isn't trying to tell me anything. Minster turned to great... Ah, OK, thank you, Julie. Well, Minster, I think, went busting it or folded in. So maybe you're right. You could well be right there. So, Julie, thank you if you are um, on. So, by the way, where we are, um, Natalie's leaving us. How cruel. Um, we'll see you soon, Natalie. Um, so it's just spinning round. We're at the Merchant Adventures Hall. But uh, time presses on. So let us, uh, let us walk on. 
So let me just have a sip of water and then we will uh, we'll push on. Gosh, we're at 10 to 7 already. Time is flying and we've still got more schnooks to see. But uh, we'll get in as many as we can before uh, the end of the tour. So I think the next one is... Uh, is it round by the Minster? I'm going to have to get my little map out. And uh, put it in the library, hidden somewhere, like a moving asteroid. I agree with you, Laura. It's, it's probably a lot of knowledge maybe he isn't lost. You're just in different kind of forms. But of course, as a collection, uh, it's a great tragedy to lose. Right, okay, so we're going to do Dean Gate. Right, so, okay, so let's, let's walk round uh, in front of the Minster and we'll head down there and we'll see what we can do. Fantastic. Fan Davy Dozy. So off we go again. So we've talked then, haven't we, about reading, as in people are read too. Your public readings, performance reading, um, people issuing instructions people probably running auctions and financial transactions. So reading as a passive thing, being read to. Um, so kind of given how early texts were meant to be heard rather than seen, the act of reading silently remained a curiosity. Now, I guess that most of you can do this. I'm not going to ask you if you move your mouth when you read, but it's a skill that most of us would expect to have by the time, I guess, we left... Uh, what we call primary school, so we may call. Uh, can, what would you call primary school? Anyway, you know, the er, your early years of your education, it will be the norm to expect. How many stocks are there, Laurie? I think there's about twenty, but some are kind of way out, you know, in like villages and stuff. So we're not going to all of them. Um, so it's a skill we'd expect a child to possess, right? But in 330 BC, when Alexander the Great read silently from a letter from his mother in front of his troops. The kind of already awestruck men were kind of further stunned by their generals or the worldly kind of capabilities. Nobody had seen somebody read silently. Just think about that for a minute, of just how strange that is. And that we have on record that Alexander the Great was one of the first people in history that conquered the world for his 25 cried because there's no more worlds to conquer. Within his skill set was reading silently. Isn't that awesome? Doesn't that just give you a, a, a you know, just a, sometimes you get bits of history that just help bring people to life in a way that cold facts or other kind of achievements, their battles and the, the success on the battlefield, I'm not saying it's rendered irrelevant, but I just find it fascinating that in this era where nobody could read to themselves silently, Alexander the Great could. I love that. Um, now, much later, in the 4th century AD, St Augustine, so we're looking now at the Minster, St Augustine, a very, very important figure in the early Christian church. So he marvels at how his mentor, St Ambrose, managed to grasp the meaning of a text Whilst, as, as, uh, as, as described, his voice was silent and his tongue was still. In other words, St Ambrose was another of these people that had taken this skill and internalised it. He could read in the way that we could. But this was so uncommon that St Augustine, that had travelled across Europe, that had visited the great monasteries of Europe and spoken to the leading thinkers of his time still hadn't experienced this. So this is how unusual this skill set is that we're talking about. This thing that we take for granted that we expect primary age. I'm guess uh, Linda, tell me, a primary school teacher, would you pretty much expect all children to read to themselves by the time they left at what, 10, 11? Give me, give me an age. I'm, not, I'm obviously not a teacher. So let me know what sort of age now would expect a child to have developed that skill if on the kind of normal sort of trajectory of knowledge. And bear in mind that in history, these people were held up as being absolutely, unbelievably skilled in order to do this. And these were people that conquered worlds and had converted half of Europe to Christianity. Remarkable. Um, so let me just have a sip of water, show you the beautiful St Williams College. before we, we walk up. And, uh, of course, the great east window 
of York Minster looking resplendent as we said against that sky. That's a shot for the ages, huh? Um, so the first kind of regulations requiring scholars to work in silence in monastic libraries date from um, the 9th century. The ancient and the medieval. Um, so there we are. So Linda's saying that by the age of six or seven, you expect children to have mastered this skill. That was so unusual in the ancient world. It just shows that what we take for granted, how we've developed, how we've in, in, engaged. Um, so silence in, in, in libraries is quite a new thing. The ancient medieval libraries up until then, and probably for a considerable time after that, would have been very different to the kind of modern concept of a quiet place to study. So for those that would like to imagine visiting the great library, Alexandria or Celsus, you need to kind of factor in the din. It would have been very, very loud. With scholars talking, discussing, reading, arguing, all this kind of going on around them. So libraries as being vibrant, noisy busy places. Again, it just tips, doesn't it, when you're thinking about these places, what they would be. Probably more akin to our marketplace. People gathering, sharing knowledge, this transfer of information. And we know, don't we, for instance, how Arabic, you know, numerals, you know, replaced Roman numerals. We're looking at constants we go past, you know, just because it was better. The Arabic numeric system just works better. But the Romans didn't think so. The Romans just had to suck it up. Because people decided it was better. They used it as a method for counting. It worked better. They could read it. So these sort of crucibles of knowledge exchange, um, I think are kind of absolutely, um, you know, the, the places, you know, where kind of human history is moulded. So the emergence of books um, is another area, really, with its kind of sort of fascinating history. So far, we haven't really talked about books. So before books we've got scrolls and many of these scrolls read from top to bottom continuously so most greek scrolls like this some you read from kind of left to right so most egyptian scrolls are left to right but greek scrolls up and down so we're a long way from the sort of standard kind of page setup that we're used to um, in this kind of day and age but by folding between the columns and stitching them together on one edge the first codices were created which are the predecessor the modern book. So the best preserved examples of these codices are from Mayan Mexico. You'll see. I'll bring that up for you to have a look at. Um, and these early codices write on the original sc scrolls to kind of determine their size so they're not uniform. They depend on kind of the size when they're stitched together. An analysis highlights their size were mostly dictated by the height of their original scroll and the codex creators dislike for overlapping joints between pasted together sheets of the scrolls. So slowly, the standard book size was emerging from this craft. So these codices were beginning to look like books and they were already around the right shape. Actually, come down here. Um, just check my route, just make sure I know where it is. That we are meant to be, because I can't quite remember. Um, so this is what becomes sort of books. So most of these kind of first century codices were um, the ones in, in text were then written uh, but they're in columns so they're not as we kind of see them today um, so in the first century you'd have four columns of text to a page so really sort of quite different to, uh, to kind of what we would experience now and uh, by about the fourth century we've got kind of pages being kind of two columns I'm just checking the map as to where we are some moral gardens. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. then back that way. Yeah, I thought we'd miss one out. So I'm not quite sure what's around here, but there's one down here, I believe. Um, so sometimes you've got one column. So we get the beginnings of the one column page in these codices, these stitched together scrolls in the first century. So again, we've kind of got, you know, again, we're, we're feeling our way now, aren't we, towards, I think it feels like, a modern book that we all kind of get behind and go, yeah, recognise me, that is something akin to the modern world, our kind of modern experience. Um, and those kind of practical considerations as well for the size of each page in these kind of codices. Books were rarely wider than they were tall because it had put too much strain on the spine. 
And academics also suggest that possible consideration was the size of the vats. Now, the vats, what we mean by this, of course, is um, w w w where, where the paper's being made, as you might say, um, is the width of the vat. Uh, it, was, it was basically the arm's length of the guy that was producing it. So this could well have been the impact, the arm span of the paper producers, the vat man, um, could have defined the original sizes of paper. But let's just pause that thought, because another schnook is upon us. And this is the great Oglesby. I couldn't tell you much about him. Um, other than, let's have a look. So again, we've got very modern, like Paul Nash now style uh, abstract going on. Not quite sure what it is that uh, is telling us about this, but it's very angular, modernist, almost sort of Bauhaus, Bauhaus esque. Susan, daughter, three and a half. There we go. We've got fishing going on. Seems to be a motif. I, when I, I just I thought it was a. a, a a weapon but it's not it's a fishing rod so i don't know quite exactly what the story is here uh, or indeed who the sponsor is but uh, so the great oogles let's have a look so are oh, sponsored by ydl who are they distribution logistics so don't know but uh okay we'll like him do you like him i think he's got a certain certain amount he's just snooks in a pen so people climbing on them Unfortunately, having to due to vandalism, trying to protect the structure as much as possible, and so barriers put around them. Apologies for any inconvenience. So, uh, yeah, I don't like carrot, but uh, anyway, there we are. So that that is uh, the great Oglesby. So uh, let me just check where we are heading next. So yeah, we'll go down. We'll go down Stonegate, which actually, funnily enough, was a centre of printing and publishing. So kind of another consideration um, in what was to be on book size was the reader themselves. Let me view them in there. Uh, fly fisher person, basically. Um, so obviously we read by flicking our eyes backwards and forwards across a text. It's called saccarding. It's a posh word for that. And our eyes can only handle a certain length of line. Too long, and they get kind of lost on the way back to the next line. So you think about reading something, it's a very long line. It's very, very hard coming back to keep your eyes in line. Um, too short, and we waste a lot of time and distract us by flicking between the lines too quickly. So there's kind of a sweet spot that you're looking to hit in terms of reading length and research suggests that a limit of kind of between 45 and 75 characters per line um, is that kind of sweet spot with some arguing that 66 is uh, the perfect number for this well that's true i don't know but that's that's what they say um and so this is the same reason that wider publications like newspapers and magazines set text in columns um, they'll have their own kind of standards of what represents to them a perfect line length, but they stick to it. Um, and it's to make it easy for us to scan backwards and forwards and to, to keep reading without losing our place um, on the text. But there's another piece of crucial human anatomy, which has it says, shaped our evolution, if we believe uh, Mr. Darwin, um, more than anything else, which comes into play when we're thinking about the design of what to become books. And of course, this is our hands. We use our hands when we read. So the proportions of a book look pretty similar to that of our hands, which makes sense because they should fit together. So while the first book's being bound to a, it's usually sort of put on pedestals to be read, books and were then meant to be held, which meant they should be optimised to that shape, which may also explain how books have kind of gotten shorter since their first incarnations. And... Um, and we still think about, actually, hands in book printing. If you've got a book, pick it up and tell me I'm a liar, but you might not have ever noticed the margin at the bottom of the page is bigger than the margin at the top because it's there to give space to your thumbs. So we're still thinking about the space. We're still thinking about um, you know, how we hold and our kind of physical interaction with books. Um, so I think you know, humans are kind of really shaped books but there's other things as well, um, such as human anatomy. Um, as we switch from papyrus paper in Egypt to parchment, this meant kind of using goats, cows, and kind of sheepskins, which, when trimmed with their curves, are kind of rectangular. So they're also fold easily into four folio choirs, which neatly arranged with flesh against flesh and hair sides facing each other. So you create a hairy bound cover for your book. So book sizes at this time were usually referred to by the number of times the original paper 
was folded. Because this original piece of paper varied, this didn't really tell you that much about the actual size of the volume. Today, of course, we've got standardised printer paper sheets. A full sheet is A0. In other words, it's one piece of paper with zero folds. A1 is half its size with one fold. A2 is half its size again with two folds, etc. That's how it goes all the way to A10. But actually, theoretically, it would go on forever. And what's interesting is the ratio will be maintained. It will be a rectangle all the way. So infinitesimally small, but very, very deep. It's theoretically possible if indeed you have some kind of hydraulic press to keep folding your paper. Um, but uh, there we go. So this one, as we're talking about books, here we are. They were printing the Holy Bible here in 1682. So here we are on Stonegate. And Stonegate was a very, very important part of the, the printing and publishing industry. And I'm very surprised to say the plaque has disappeared momentarily. But at this address here, Lawrence Stern produced the very first comic novel, a very stream of consciousness piece by the name of The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy. And uh, this is believed to be the first comic novel ever published, and that was here in York in the 1760s. So uh, this was a street of printers and publishers. So most books published before 1500 were quartos or folios, which uh, means they were kind of very large books. They were a luxury item, and they kind of weren't meant to be portable. So Aldo Manuzio was Italian from Venice, and he's created as being the inventor of the modern book. I wonder if that is a, a name you've ever heard of, but I guarantee he is a, he's somebody that you should be interested in indeed. It's fascinating. Um, and he began to print handbooks or portable books in 1501, pioneering and popularising the Octavo, which we still use today. And the Octavo, uh, those of you who like reading hardback books, that is Octavo size. And the Octavo is created by taking a sheet of A2 paper and folding it three times to create eight pages, 16 printed sides. This guy also invented italics. He really kind of transformed, because he's got less space. He completely transformed our reading experience. And his apprentice, believe it or not, was Erasmus of Rotterdam, a kind of major figure in the Renaissance. So Aldo, Aldo's kind of court and his kind of print works were at the center of transforming our understanding, but also our contact with books. So the handbooks, the book that was meant to be carried and taken around with you, was uh, absolutely, you know, now part of this, in the dates of 1500. So by that time, books look pretty similar to what we have now. So if I've got an image here, I'll just show you. Uh, yeah, so this is one of his books. So I would say, I don't know what you think, but this looks like it could have been published very recently. So this is published in the very, very early years of the 16th century. And I think you'd agree that we've now arrived at what you'd have to say is the modern book. So with the Octavo, modernity. Something we can relate to, something we can see um, as very much part of our contemporary experience has arrived by about 1500, thanks to this very, very innovative guy from, uh, from Venice. So our next schnook on the tour is uh, wherever there is light, the flowers will find it. This is done by the artist, Sean Ellis, who is the person responsible. She's painted this one herself. So most of them are done by different kind of artists. And uh, we have a lady who has a bit of a tree for her hair, I guess. Little birds popping out, some flowers, a lot of warmth and a kind of humanity in this one. I said it's sunny, lovely. Uh, isn't it beautiful? Really, really happy. Ah, very good, Judy. Seems it's an autograph, two different things. Um, isn't that stunning? Be lovely. Just makes you think about it, doesn't it? You're coming back and some flowers and just, oh, just lovely. Got a little bird. It's a bit like the Twitter bird, that isn't it? Or the X bird now. Is, is, is the X bird gone? Has Elon Musk killed the X bird? Probably. Don't approve of him. Think he's a dick. Sorry, use my language. But uh, I'm not into Elon Musk. I think he's a. Uh, just another one, he's inherited a lot of wealth and that likes to sort of credit himself with, of course, doing wonderful things with his inherited wealth. But uh, there we go. So, yeah, we're just in front of Betty's, just for 
as Julie mentioned is there, in case of location. And we've sort of got a chocolatey, sort of a Cabri-esque, isn't it? The colours that we've got to, we've got going on there. So, uh, how nice is that one? So let me just have a look where we are. Now, for this Blake Street, so we'll go up to the old Art Gallery, Exhibition Square, next. So not many more to see on this tour, but uh, we're running a little bit over, but uh, I guess some people may have gone to join other tours, which of course, we understand. When you run over, that's perfectly fine. But uh, for those that are still here, fantastic. We've got, I think, probably another three or four to see. So let us, let us continue onwards on our tour. And uh, off we'll go. So we were talking about Octavo books, weren't we? And so let's, uh, let's kind of continue. So as I say, we've kind of, with Octavo books, we've kind of reached now the modern world in terms of, in terms of you know, books that we um, imagine. So it's books that are not just kind of writing in the sort of general proportions, but also handheld in the area, in the kind of size we've sort of come to expect. Probably a little bit larger, we wouldn't really call necessarily the size of a handbook now something that was the, an octavo, but you get the idea. It's no longer something that is in a library on a pedestal. It's now designed to be read and taken from place to place. So it's the kind of the print revolution really now that kind of defines how everything just jumps forward in terms of kind of evolution. So the earliest kind of print technology um, originated in China, Japan, and Korea. So the Imperial State of China produced a large um, amount of printed material by rubbing paper against ink woodblock to uh, kind of sustain its extensive bureaucratic system. So they were using it for record keeping. And the knowledge of kind of print technology reached the Western world around the 13th century. And uh, woodblock printing attained widespread popularity by the 15th century. So woodblock, by the way, is when you kind of carve out of wood. So you take a flat piece of wood, it's got a bit of depth to it, and you carve out a new verse, don't you? The things that you want to um, kind of capture and see. And then in doing so, um, you, uh, so I'm hoping we'll be able to see, we'll go around to the, the thing and then we'll come back and see this one on the way back. Um, so you get it in reverse, so you then roll over your ink and you get a, the shape um, or, the, or the, the, the image is displayed in reverse. That's woodblock printing. So before printing presses, you get woodblock. Um, so woodblocks really kind of up the ante in terms of, of the, the, the quantity that can be produced um, and also the durability of the kind of final products. Compared to handwritten manuscripts and scrolls in libraries or tablets, these things are designed to last. And the ever sort of rising demand for books leads to kind of further um, interest in how can we make this, you know, more technological, just printing, because woodcut printing is still the essence of sort of pulling down a press and, it, and, it, and it obviously connecting with um, the surface inking once, but how can we mechanise this? And this, of course, is where the printing press comes into its own. So in the 1430s, Johannes Gutenberg develops the first mechanical printing press in Strasbourg, which was then in Germany, now in France, but then in Germany. And the press was operational in Mainz, a place in Germany, in the 1450s, and was printing copies of what would come to be known as the Gutenberg Bible. So again, I've got an image to show you with, uh, with the Bible. So this is, again, we've got four columns. So I'm just trying to expand that, just get rid of your chat for it. So there we go. So that's what the, the Gutenberg Bible looks like, published in the 1450s. So again, in, in many respects, it looks like a handwritten manuscript, which is, so it, it's kind of, it really is um, a bridge between the two, isn't it? So it's going from what would have been the manuscripts in monasteries, handwritten in the scriptorums by the monks, that kind of studiously kind of copied these things out. But the difference was now, is you could do this mechanically. So instead of this being handwritten, they were now mechanically produced. So consequently, the quantity of Bibles that you can produce just skyrockets. We've got the age now of technology, of mass production, of the ability to kind of produce significant numbers and volume of publications. And the Gutenberg Bible is the first um, sort of piece of sort of consumable. Um, and of course, given the time and the age, it's not at all surprising that it's kind of very much kind of religious led and faith led. So the great explosion of books, in missals, and prayer books, books of hours, books of days, this sort of are kind of faith-based kind of publications. Um, so that, of course, becomes 
um, the area where you sort of see the explosion of printing. But it really is the beginnings of the modern world. It's the internet sort of part one, if you like, is printing. Because suddenly you're giving access, you're democratising knowledge. You're making it affordable. If people are able to read, they're able to learn, they're able to understand and embrace knowledge of the world. So it's a huge, huge, huge big deal is the image of the printing press. So we are in Exhibition Square. We are down to see our next schnooky walk. It is in front of us here. And uh, here we are. A book about art and protest called Find Your Voice. Well, that's, that's telling, so I was going to talk about that before we finish off. Actually, how protest and reading are linked very well. This is very, uh, very timely. So it's called How to Find Your Voice, sponsored by the Art of Protest. And uh, that's quite angry there. Do you think it, it, it seems to be the normal friendly, smiley element has gone there. So we seem to find this snook is, he's in the kind of process of thinking about themselves and about art and protests and what they can do to make the world, to change the world, to inject new ideas or new impetus into old ideas, perhaps. Who knows? But uh, the sort of book of Kells in Dublin, fantastic Susan, beautiful thing, all hand drawn, of course. So, you know, this is the thing is we're able to reproduce now with the printing press a facsimile of the book of Kells's other gospels, Lily's Farm Gospels, so they can be shared and taken around to different kind of places. And um, so, you know, inevitably you kind of get a ubiquity of print, um, and reading becomes. The norm. And at first, it's fair to say, that obviously, I'm saying Christian church, the Catholic church, were not at all keen. Don't forget that for centuries, everything had been in Latin. In fact, it was a heresy to print books in your own language. Miles Cuffadell of York, who's got his little plaque on the Minster, was, a, was very much a heretic, a Protestant, who was involved in producing English Bibles at a time where you could be burned at the stake for producing a Bible in a language that wasn't in Latin. So you realize the risks these people were running. I'm working, sorry. Um, the, 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 they were exposing us to tremendous risks um, in producing these Bibles. But they believed that the scripture, the word of the Lord, should be available to everybody, should be available in their own language, in plain language, in working man's language, so that this could communicate and we wouldn't need our relationship with pastors to be the same. We wouldn't need them to translate, they wouldn't need to be the keepers of our souls and our destinies we could start to make decisions as ourselves. So what we're talking about is the link between the, um, the written word and the emergence of the idea of the individual, which is a very, very Reformation concept. Insofar as, if we look at medieval literature and stories, they tell us of big things, disasters, circles of hell, Okay, and things we've got no control over. Moving to the Renaissance and Reformation, and suddenly we get stories that are about heroes with feet of clay. Shakespeare is the great teller of individual tales, isn't he? He tells us stories of people like Macbeth, of Julius Caesar, people who make decisions, and the decisions impact them on this lifetime, not in the next. So it's a kind of complete change of narrative. And this idea that once we're given access to the scripture, we can take responsibility for ourselves as individuals. We're not just part of a flock. We can make our decisions for right or for wrong, and we'll hold accountable for those decisions. So once the church kind of gets its head around post-reformation, education becomes absolutely the kind of key focus. Teach them to read and write, particularly children. And so the church is set out to educate the masses through reading. Through the establishment of kind of village schools, literacy grows. So booksellers printed copies of sort of popular ballads and folklores to increase popular appetites for their wares. So we start to get Pulp Fiction for the first time. Enjoyable, not your airport lounge stuff, yeah? Um, English, they were called the ch chat books, in French, Bibliothèque Bleu, were kind of pedal, which was sold by kind of traveling salesmen, very, very popular, often a bit risque as well. Periodicals start in the early 18th century. Um, so periodicals being obviously things that come out on a weekly or a monthly basis, sometimes about arts and science, sometimes you know, about, um, uh, literature and stories, sometimes a mix of both. But 
it kind of creates loyal readers, so subscribers, as you might say. If you haven't already, do subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, around this time, we get the novel as a literary form, sort of takes root. And uh, when, in 1849, Charles Dickens' Pickwick Papers were serialised, um, it was in a magazine, it was a Bentley's Miscellany. And it was published sort of week by week, and it became a huge hit. People going out you know, on the day of publication to go and buy uh, you know, the, the latest copy to find out what's going to happen. And they were very, very cheap. So it meant the readers could kind of live these stories for months on end. It was fantastic that uh, um, you, know, you, you had uh, suddenly this availability of knowledge. So here we are, one of our final snooky books on this tour. And it's called It Takes a Village, Frankie the Fostering Snook. So this just encourages, uh, I did Latin as well, Sandra, and I loved it as well. Um, it takes a village to raise a child, I believe that that is. The, I don't know who said that, but it's lovely, isn't it? Um, and so it's talking about fostering, really, and our responsibilities to one another. Um, how we might give children an opportunity for a better future than otherwise they might, uh, they might have. So this is promoting to us the idea of fostering. So uh, if you have been involved in fostering, kudos to you, it's a wonderful thing to be involved. I don't know if you call it the same on your side of the Atlantic, but basically it is uh, it's taking children that are usually in peril, problems with, with, with parents, violence at home, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, that sort of thing, and taking them in for, for a period of time to try and give a child some stability. So that's what we call fostering, I'm not sure if it's called the same thing uh, where you are, but that's the kind of idea. So it takes a village to raise a child. So it's a lovely idea. Um, so we are, it's almost, like I, it's almost like I've written this tour, right? Planning and knowing what it's going to be, um, which I sort of did, um, because we're in front of the Lending Library. So this is York's Library, Lindy would love it in here, lots of your bibliophiles would love it in here, York Central Library. And the establishment of, kind of lending or kind of circulation libraries, coupled with the advent of printing technologies, were developments that kind of revolutionised reading for the common people. The 18th century or proliferation of these institutions actually allowed readers to take items from their collection to the home, both in Europe and North America. And readers made use of this opportunity individually as well as collectively by organising themselves into reading groups and book clubs. Isn't that a lovely idea, you know, that, that libraries and lending give rise to book clubs and make it sociable? which is individual. Um, and it's, it's fair to say that the public reading didn't go, in fact, Charles Dickens really went in for it hugely. Um, so reading, kind of doing public readings, was very much seen as a pleasant dinner time entertainment for the wealthy uh, in, in their homes in the 18th and 19th centuries. And popular authors embraced this tradition with varying degrees of fervour. Charles Dickens was tremendously kind of uh, dramatic the way that he would do his kind of readings. You know, the death of Nancy from Oliver Twist was in particular you know, something to kind of behold. Um, kind of eyes and stalks, you know, as he portrays Bill, 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 Bill Sykes, isn't it? Uh, in kind of murderous fervour. Um, but uh, nonetheless, you know, public readings were very much uh, the verb. So let me just show you this one. So this is around the ooze in 60 minutes with Ebor Passport. So this is sponsored by City Cruiser. So obviously they are giving you an idea of the sort of things you can expect to find uh, if you get on a boat on the river which is to go down to Millennium Bridge, which you've visited the Cycle Bridge uh, down the south of the river. Roundtree's Park we've also visited on tour. The cat sculptures we've seen on these tours. We've got Palace I've shown you on these tours. Sea Cruises Boat, yeah, that's just over there. Fulford Hall, we've not been to Fulford Hall, but uh, perhaps we should. And uh, over here, Fishman of Dreams, I've shown you that over on uh, Iron Bridge, A Castle Malbis. Little Tower Bridge we're about to walk over. Guildhall I'll show you on the way. Clifford's Tower we started at, and uh, the King's Arms we've seen, and the Hospital of the Museum Guards we've seen. So um, we've seen pretty much all of those. Now people watch Corrie and EastEnders. Indeed, indeed they do, Susan, but apparently not as much as they did. I was listening to the radio the other day, and apparently audiences are a fraction of what they once were for these soap operas. So there's question marks about their long-term survival. Um, so going back to public readings, there's another reason why sometimes people do public readings. And uh, you may have heard of a chap called Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a very, very important thinker in France. And now in pre-revolutionary France, he had been banned. His ideas were simply too much. Partly because he wrote an awful lot about these fantasies of being spanked by his nanny, um, which I think was probably slightly kind of 
uh, pretty too much um, in the kind of philosophical text. Um, but there you go. Um, but because he'd been banned, a bit like the Marquis de Sade, you couldn't read these books. They couldn't be published. So actually, kind of reading at Houses of Friends was the only way that Rousseau could uh, could get his ideas out there. So even as education sort of becomes more widespread, being able to read was a major avenue for entertainment and acquiring knowledge, especially for women. So well into the 19th century, women were encouraged to acquire only very minimal education, very minimal. And their scholarly ambitions were really kind of frowned upon. Being read to by family and friends was kind of acceptable. So hence, you know, the, 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 the readings after dinner and so forth. Um, and provided women with some semblance of an outlet for their curiosity and hunger for stories. So once primary education becomes accessible and acceptable, younger members of the family then read to the elders in a kind of sweet reverse of the kind of classic grandma's tales. It's really kind of nice, isn't it? The idea of, you know, a bit like, you know, you might find uh, with, with immigrant families, the children do, do, do translation for the older ones whose English isn't sort of quite so good. Um, so you've got like, the same thing going on there, which is lovely. And uh, so we increased kind of literacy, better punctuation, and books that were made accessible to the general public by the inclusion of pictures or simplification of language, silent reading becomes the norm. So, uh, you know, as Linda answered there, between five and seven, lots of you talked about, you know, grandchildren, neighbours, and, and, and kids, you know, three, four, and five couldn't master school. Well, it becomes the norm now. Um, and it allows readers, I think, to form a sort of more of a personal connection with the written text um, without sort of someone else's voice and interpretation acting as intermediaries. So silent reading was made a kind of private activity, making room for more options in a choice of the reading nook. Now Chaucer, the 14th century author, recommends reading in bed in the 14th century. So I think that's a, that's a pretty good idea. And uh, Umar Khayyam, the, the Persian poet, he advocated outdoor reading. So did Mary Shelley, author of Frankenstein, while Henry Miller and Marcel Proust preferred the absolute solitude of the bathroom. Let's not ask or delve too deeply what they were doing in the bathroom while they were reading, but uh, they reckoned it was the perfect spot. Um, so protest, kind of reading as rebellion. We've seen so far in a kind of short exploration of the history of reading, the power of the written word, which in turn is kind of transferred onto its readers um, and has kind of been recognised since ancient times. And it's therefore no great surprise that authority figures throughout history have tried to prevent people um, that they, they oppress um, from accessing reading material um, that might challenge the prevailing ideas. So for these marginalised groups, reading against all odds and in severely adverse circumstances has been a courageous act of rebellion and resistance. So enslaved peoples, um, both in the dominions of the British Empire and the Americas, um, were denied access to reading for centuries. But they still managed to learn to read. Look at all the lovely daffodils over here. We're doing, I'll just cross over to you and have a look at the daffodils. I think we're going to the memorial gardens. And then, thanks. Um, just check my map, I'll just show you the daffodils. Because it's such a highlight of York this time of year to see the daffodils. Might come out next week and just do two daffodils actually. That'd be quite nice, wouldn't it? Um, we'll do the walls and some daffodils maybe next week. Let me just have a look where we are. Headed to. Dun, 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 dun. 10, 12, yeah, principal York, yeah. Yeah, two more to go. Um, isn't that lovely? So, a little bit of a heads up there. So, people, they still manage to read, often risking their lives in the process, um, using kind of unobserved, often incongruous methods of learning. Um, the literature many of these people taught themselves, um, they used it to kind of teach themselves to read and to write, and went on to become a kind of potent weapon in the battle against slavery and oppression. And women's reading and intellectual ambition was discouraged often violently in societies all over the world, despite um, sort of some of the earliest poets and authors having been women. Yet kind of largely kind of cut off from the outer world and forced into the routines of domesticity, generations of women taught themselves to read and write. They wrote copious volumes about their own experience, and many of which stood the test of time and are now recognised as classics. Women in China and Japan invented their own di dialects used specifically for communication between women. In India, Rashundarai Devi was the author of the first autobiography in Bengali, taught herself to write by scribbling letters over the soot 
left over in a traditional wood-burning oven after a day's arduous cooking. All women book clubs that discuss literature from a female point of view have been mentioned as early as the 15th century in a French book about medieval women's beliefs called the Distaff Gospels. Now cookbooks were um, an area where women were actually accepted as authors writing instructions for other women to read. But even so, these are originally written by men. One of the important surviving medieval texts, have you heard of it, is called The Good Man of Paris. It dates from about 1392, 1393 around then. And it's a fascinating book. It's a present to a bride from a new husband. But the thing is, is that he is an elderly, wealthy Parisian. And she's 15. Um, and so this is basically a guidebook for her. And this was very common, actually, for young girls in noble families, not the top families, but noble families, to marry somebody very old, a widower generally. And the idea was that that widower would teach the girl household skills, how to do with servants, run households, home economics, cookery, all these kind of skills. Um, and then as a result of that, what would happen is that they'd then acquire all these skills. The guy would then obviously die. She'd be left a certain amount of money, but not all the money. So the family were quite happy with this. There'd be no children produced. Um, and so she'd then have a dowry to go and make a second uh, marriage, which is the kind of love marriage. So um, it's a kind of cookbook is The Good Man of Paris. Um, the home economic journal, but also kind of missive on being a good wife. Teach her how to run a noble household and teach her all the skills. Um, but there's another really interesting area of why cookbooks emerged to be hugely possible. Um, because obviously knowing the correct way to prepare for banquets and so forth is, uh, is jolly important. But most people wouldn't have had access to cookbooks. Before cookbooks lined our shelves, kind of cooks learned by observation, by, by watching others to kind of how to manage a hearth, an oven, how to prepare food, and how to feed a family. Which brings us to another one I hope, I hope there's been a few of these, what you might call nuggets of fascinating history. Um, in relation to American history, you can say hello very quickly. Uh, someone, I'm on YouTube Live right now. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, and this is about American history in the South. Um, deep rooted, of course, in food. So slaves in America were purveyors of food. So much so that after the Civil War ended and Reconstruction was underway, white women found that they had no idea how to prepare the food that their men loved. Because that skill bank and that knowledge base had moved away. And whilst not all cooks in America prior to the Civil War were slaves, it's crucial to recognise that the need for culinary education came not just from people wanting to learn how to cook, but from people needing to learn how to cook. And that necessity was a kind of result of the subjugation of entire race of people. When we talk of American cuisine, specifically Southern cuisine, we're talking about a way of eating that was developed and prepared by African slaves. So we're in the last but one of our stocks. a long tour, wasn't it? I didn't realize it was going to be take us this long. And uh, this is Webo. So say hello to Webo, which I guess you're relating to uh, the internet. And uh, he's green, he's got a Y connective. So he's, I guess he's to do with the, the hotel, the principal chain behind us. He's a very studious with his glasses. Let's have a high vis jacket on. So I'm not quite sure, if I'm being brutally honest, uh, what it is that we're kind of being told here. But uh, nonetheless, it's always nice to, uh, to check out one more song. So I think we've got one more to go. It's in the station, I'm told. I've no idea where. So, uh, so let's kind of go over. We've got a 10% battery left, so we need to make sure we get there quickly. So totalitarian regimes, of course, have always recommended, recognised the importance of keeping people subservient to kind of ideas. If you can exploit people, you know, don't expose them to knowledge. Um, they've been placing blanket bans on books, of course, against your different versions of reality since the age of time. Um, and, you know, that goes all the way back to ancient Athens, happened in China, wanted to burn everything. So you know, the Chinese emperor, this idea that, that the world's history starts with him, wanted to burn all the knowledge before that. In the Roman Catholic Church, of course, they began to maintain an index of forbidden books in the 1550s. In Nazi Germany, of course, there was a propaganda machine that made a spectacle of kind of book burning, um, with each book being kind of burnt, receiving its own individual epigram. 
So colonial rulers tried to ban and prevent the circulation of printed material. They would question the legitimacy of their ruling colonies all over the world. So the power of the written world has also been misused and is still being misused to spread false information and hatred. But the international community of readers has endured. And that large scale have shown themselves capable and equal to the responsibility that comes with the power of being readers. Over the course of history, readers have demanded better for the things that they read. And where they can't find them, they've gone ahead and written it themselves. So we're going to go in search of our final snook. Don't know where it is. It's inside the station. We may well get accosted one more time because uh, it's the end of the day. I could have been drinking alcohol. And unfortunately, it is very much an occupational hazard of doing this is you become catnip to drunks, attention seekers. So we will uh, look at So I do hope you've enjoyed our time together, our little uh, rumination on reading this thing that we take so much for granted, but that actually is a revolutionary act. This piece of communication skills and tools we've developed that enable us to share information, skills across communities, across time, and across cultures. But sometimes it's just that simple stuff. So here, our final snook of the day has a travel guide. Information, you arrive into station maybe a foreign land a foreign city the first thing you want to know is how to get where i need to go so consequently rail tells schnook is about i suppose the kind of pedestrian end isn't it of reading our ability to assimilate the information that can help us to enable us to get the information that we need so i very much enjoyed it do let me know which has been your favorite of the snooks i've definitely enjoyed taking you out to see them today it's been an absolute joy um, i know i'm very very low on battery power so i'm going to leave the station now. I'll, I'll flick myself around so I may well disappear in a puff or a puff if I do so. You'll understand that it is because I've run a long tour and my battery is now about spent. But I've enjoyed it. I enjoyed researching that and um, you know hopefully it's given sort of sort of pause for thought really about this thing that we kind of take for granted um, of how important it is. So really I guess whether we are readers on electronic screens, whether we want pictures whether we want pages, whether we need to in Braille or other assistive technology, whether we like audiobooks. It doesn't really so much matter how we consume. What matters is that we read, we expose ourselves to knowledge, we think about it, we consider it, we share it, we discuss, we debate, and we encourage others, particularly children, of course, to do the same, to develop that love, that inquiring mind, that desire to access knowledge. And if these snooks go some way towards that, then fantastic. Well done to everybody involved. There's nothing, you know, better really than the thought of children going home and picking up a book in response to that. Maybe that's far fetched, who knows? But even if it just affects one or two children, I would think it's been a worthwhile investment. And uh, no, I, I, I don't read all the chat coming through. Obviously, Julie, you've probably been able to say some of the things that have meant I don't need to sort of comment on where we are. At any given time, so uh, no, no, it, it adds colour as long as other people don't mind. They're very happy for me. Um, so thank you, everybody. Thank you for your support. I'm not quite sure where I'm next touring and what we're doing next, but uh, there'll be something, I've no doubt. And uh, so this has been one. Of, this has been one I've enjoyed because I kind of thought, how am I going to do um, the snooks? So as ever, it's not when you do things like the ice show, the snooks, or anything, it's not the things. It's the space in between. What do you use to pull it all together? So I think, or I hope, that uh, using it, because they're all about literacy, promoting reading, that kind of a history of reading, and kind of how we, we came to the modern book, as a, as, as, a, as a glue, as a pair of laces, if you like, that have pulled it all together. And we've had all manner of variety, have we not, from ones made of chocolate, to ones made of Yorkshire puddings, and everything in between. So I'm going to say thank you so much, everybody from York. If you haven't already, do subscribe to my channel. Uh, give this video a like uh, if you want to make a contribution that'd be fantastic you can do so uh, send home free treats on paypal or buy me a coffee and otherwise of course i look forward to seeing you very very soon so thank you from york goodbye